Good morning, I'm Harley Schlanger from the LaRouche Organization with your daily video update for August 18th, 2022. The topic for today is going to be the unconstitutional precedent for the raid on the home of Donald Trump, the former president. To, to really understand the background to this operation, the, the raid by the Justice Department and FBI agents of the Mar-a-Lago home of President Trump, it's crucial to review the precedent for this and for the continuing attack on Trump. And that precedent is the persecution of American statesman and economist Lyndon LaRouche. Now, the FBI first identified LaRouche as a threat during his intervention into the student movement against the Vietnam War. Typical Quintal Pro operations of trying to uh, provoke riots and, and fights within the, the movement, within the so-called left. Well, LaRouche was moving to create a different kind of mobilization, not just anti-war, but one to explain why we were in this war and what the alternatives would be. So he was first brought to the attention of the FBI during this, which conducted the, as I said, black bag jobs against uh, his movement at the time. But he really emerged as an important figure after the August 15th, 1971 decision by the Nixon administration to break with the Bretton Woods system, which LaRouche had forecast was coming. And he used the opportunity of the break to point out that this was imposed on the United States by British operations, and the intention was to move toward a Shaktian economic policy. And it was his debate with Abba Lerner, a promoter of that Shaktian policy, which occurred in December 71, which caused a, a, a real avalanche, a storm of protest against him from left and right circles. Now, this continued as LaRouche became more and more prominent internationally. He was at the center of a campaign against the International Monetary Fund, the agency that after the, well, it was set up under Bretton Woods, but initially it was just there to regulate currency exchange. But after the break in 1971, which removed the gold reserve basis for the dollar, the IMF became the enforcement arm of private banks, especially in imposing austerity conditions, uh, brutal conditions against the former colonial nations. Now, LaRouche proposed something in 1975 called the International Development Bank to replace the IMF, which would include debt moratorium or cancellation or rescheduling uh, a full-scale decolonization, not just in name, but in substance, which would include investment in the real economy of developing sector nations, which was what was intended initially by President Roosevelt when he uh, drafted the original background to the uh, Bretton Woods system. This idea of LaRouche was presented to the United Nations in September 1976 by the representative from Guyana, Fred Wills, this again provoked a storm of outrage against LaRouche, especially because this caught the attention of many world leaders. And in the subsequent years, LaRouche had meetings with Indira Gandhi, the Prime Minister of India, President Jose Lopez Portillo of Mexico, and he spoke at many international conferences and forums. Now, in, in the early 1980s, as the debt crisis again accelerated, especially in Mexico and, and Latin America, LaRouche met with President Lopez Portillo and drafted a proposal, not just for Mexico, but for a reorganization of the global financial system. Again, this became uh, prominent when Lopez Portillo presented the basic idea of LaRouche at the UN General Assembly meeting in September 1982. Now, at the same time, LaRouche was working with the Reagan administration to negotiate with the Soviet Union on what became known after March 1983 as the Strategic Defense Initiative. LaRouche had, along with Dr. Edward Teller, developed this idea, brought it to the attention of the Reagan administration, and it became Reagan administration policy, which 
angered the Soviet Union, but also triggered an absolute freakout by Henry Kissinger. Now, prior to this, Kissinger had already called for judicial actions against Lyndon LaRouche. On August 19, 1982, he wrote a letter to FBI Director William Webster insisting that there be an investigation of the LaRouche organization. Uh, Less than, or just about a week later, a letter was received by the FBI from the British government calling for an investigation into LaRouche. Kissinger's relationship with the British was very well known from his comments about how he kept the British better briefed than his American counterparts when he was Secretary of State. Where did he deliver that speech? At Chatham House, the British Intelligence Center. Then between that August letter and November 1982, there were an exchange of letters from Kissinger and his attorney to the FBI. Now, this became much more urgent for Kissinger and his networks after Reagan's March 23, 1983 announcement of the SDI that he had endorsed LaRouche's policy. Now, shortly after this, you had the decision then to go with a full-scale investigation of LaRouche. In January 1983, the Criminal Division of the Justice Department opened an investigation. Now, this was moving in a, a... consistent direction, including the planting of repeated slanders against LaRouche, charges that he was an anti-Semite, that he was a Nazi, that he was a communist, he was a Soviet agent, virtually every kind of attack you can imagine. Never did they cover what LaRouche was saying or doing, but just what his enemies were accusing him of. This became even more important in the in April 1986, the spring of 86, when two LaRouche candidates for statewide office in Illinois won the Democratic primaries for lieutenant governor and secretary of state. Once again, you had an outpouring from the Democrats and the Republicans. Get LaRouche. Stop LaRouche. And in October 6th, 1986, there was a raid on LaRouche's home in Virginia. This included 400 law enforcement agents, including armed FBI operatives, helicopters, even a tank or two, with the intent of provoking a firefight and the assassination of LaRouche. Now, fortunately, our legal staff went to the Justice Department and arranged that LaRouche could turn himself in later. But the intent was there as was indicated by one of the sheriff's deputies in Loudoun County who said that he had a bullet with LaRouche's name on it. Now, this then led to the indictment of LaRouche by the Get LaRouche Task Force. The original indictment was in Boston, Massachusetts, and the U.S. attorney who was conducting the anti-LaRouche, the Get LaRouche Task Force, was none other than Robert Mueller, who later came to prominence in the Russiagate anti-Trump operation. So in 1988, Mueller was deployed against Lyndon LaRouche. The case in Boston ended in a mistrial based on government misconduct in the way they conducted the, the prosecution. So the venue was shifted to the home court for the Justice Department in Alexandria, Virginia. And in December 1988, LaRouche was convicted among other charges, a one-man conspiracy to defraud the Internal Revenue Service. The slanders continued. The escalation continued as he went to prison and served five years. Now, this did not stop Lyndon LaRouche, who ran for president from prison, who wrote books from prison, who conducted an expose of the corruption of not just the Justice Department, but the intelligence community, and the overall policies of Wall Street and London. An example of this was his warning in January 2001, prior to the inauguration of George W. Bush, that the Bush administration would run into economic problems and would resort to a Reichstag fire type event to initiate a process of emergency government. 
Keep in mind that nine months later, 9-11 occurred, and we saw the implementation of the Patriot Act, the super spying operation, precisely as LaRouche had warned it would take place. Let me just conclude this section on LaRouche by pointing out that Ramsey Clark, the former Attorney General of the United States, was one of LaRouche's attorneys on his appeal. And he wrote that the LaRouche case, quote, involves a broader range of deliberate and systemic misconduct and abuse of power to destroy a political leader and movement than any other federal prosecution in my knowledge, unquote. That's why we say this was the precedent for what later became known as Russiagate. It was the permanent bureaucracy of the FBI, the same networks that LaRouche identified of the FBI and the Justice Department that carried out with the CIA, with the British GCHQ and the British MI6, carried out the operation against Donald Trump. And what was the issue of Russiagate? It was that Trump wished to have a friendly relationship with Russia. This was why he was targeted with the bogus uh, Christopher Steele dossier, which claimed that Putin was blackmailing him, that the Russians intervened on in the election to help Trump win. All of this has been proven to be fraudulent, a fabrication by the Clinton campaign with the FBI, with the media. But this continued for the four years of the Trump presidency to do everything that was possible to prevent him from pursuing this goal of achieving a friendly, stable relationship with Russia. And as a result, today we have the war in Ukraine, which could become a nuclear confrontation between the U.S. and Russia. Now, it's in this context that we see the raid that took place at Mar-a-Lago last week. What was the intent of this? Well, the short answer and obvious answer is to destroy the potential for Donald Trump to run for president in 2024. But there's a deeper point here. It's to continue the intimidation of the American people, to continue what's done with censorship, with lying narratives, to distort the debate, to make sure there's no debate on strategic issues, such as should we be spending billions of dollars to have Ukrainians killed trying to degrade Russia? Should we be sending Nancy Pelosi on her broomstick to Taiwan to stir up provocations against the Chinese government that would result in a war which military analysts know the U.S. would lose? This is what LaRouche was fighting against, this global hegemony of the unipolar order, the Wolfowitz-Cheney doctrine of fighting these endless wars. This is what the military-industrial complex is all about. Now, the irony here is that the attempt to intimidate and disrupt the debate, intimidate the American people and disrupt the debate, is not working. People are waking up. And a significant part of that is the discovery of the LaRouche case and LaRouche's ideas. Lyndon LaRouche never gave up. And his death in February 2019, uh, as uh, sad as it was, did not end his influence. In fact, his influence is growing. And we see this in the moves toward a new financial architecture that are uh, including Russia and China, but also many of the global South nations where LaRouche visited and met with leaders. There's an opposition to the global hegemony of what uh, Secretary of State Blinken calls the rules-based order, which is based on rules made by Western banks to subjugate nations, to take away their sovereignty, and to turn their people into slaves. And they're doing that now in Western countries as well. That's why farmers are demonstrating in Europe. That's why there's tremendous opposition to the policies of the Biden administration in the United States. We now have an opportunity to write, to exonerate LaRouche, to right the wrong that was done to him over 40 years, and to use the precedent of LaRouche to reverse the attacks on Donald Trump. We're going to be holding a conference 
uh, September 10th and 11th, to discuss the legacy of LaRouche. Uh, we'll have more information on this posted on our website in the days to come. I urge you to register for the conference, help us organize it, and let's take this reawakening that's going on worldwide against this global elite. Let's take it and establish a new security and financial architecture that takes power out of the hands of these unconstitutional maniacs who believe that they have the right to dictate policy to the world. Thanks for joining me. Since tomorrow's Friday, I'll take your questions. You can send them to me at harleysch at gmail.com.